It's the next level. Today I can report to the American people that Black Noir has conducted an operation killing the super terrorist known as Nakib. But that doesn't mean sacrifices won't still be made. The proof of that, sadly, lies before us. For today, we mourn a fallen member of the Seven, translucent, murdered in cold blood by the cartel super terrorists El Diablo. Welcome back to the show, panelers. I'm Mark, and I'm Steve. And Mark, I have to, I have to explain myself. I have to correct myself. Actually, that last week when we were talking about episode ten of Umbrella Academy season two, I thought that five was present at the funeral. But I went back. I rewatched the scene several times. I slowed it down. I paused it. I counted. I looked at faces. I looked at people. And no, five is not at that funeral for Ben. So I, my confusion is is quelled. Now, there is a slight confusion I, that if you listen to Strange Indeed's podcast, one of their feedback said, and I, ha- I have to go back and rewatch when Ben in, in episode nine, when Ben is talking to Vanya, because the, the their feedback said that he said he's been dead for 17 years, but I think he said he died when he was 17. Because that uh, would be correct, but he's not. He hasn't been dead for seventeen. If he died in two thousand six, and it's now twenty nineteen, you know when, when they went back in time, he wouldn't have been dead for seventeen years. So there's a little bit of confusion there, but we'll have to see. You know, maybe the writers just kind of messed up, or maybe he misspoke it and nobody caught it. Uh, you know, on continuity stuff, but not a big deal. It didn't have me spiraling as much as when I thought five was present. Yeah, at the funeral. So, yeah. well, uh, at least... but we're not we're done talking about Umbrella Academy. So, <laughs> yeah, we're... at least for now. Yeah, we're heading on to the boys, and this week we're covering the boys season two, episode one, the big ride. But before, but, but let's make let's get some housekeeping out of out of order or get some sure. housekeeping done just to make sure everybody knows if you're listening to this, Mark and I have watched the entire. I hope you watched episode eight, Mark. Oh, I finally uh, did. <laughs> okay, because if you didn't, there's a huge spoiler. That's that's because we are a spoiler full podcast for the entire second season of the boys. I want everybody to be aware of that we have already watched it through. So as we rewatch these episodes kind of in a slower fashion we're doing it from the point of view of we know episode eight so just i want our listeners to be aware of that if you're if you're thinking that we have not watched the entire episode that is not the season that is not correct we have watched the entire season so we're caught up we know so we're going to talk about foreshadowing i've got some stuff about foreshadowing we're going to talk about what we see that's going to play into later on in the season and and all that so just i want everybody to be aware that if you have not finished the boys season two go back and finish the boys season two and then come back and listen to our rewatch podcast exactly yeah this will be completely spoiler filled (laughs) as far as future episodes things that we think of may come because as we know my memory stinks but in the sense that when i rewatch these movie uh these movies these episodes i get more out of it than i did the first time i'm a little bit more of awareness so as we look at these and try to study these it's pretty interesting so with that we'll we'll go into the boys season two episode one the big ride and the synopsis for that episode is with Butcher still missing, Huey, Mother's Milk, Frenchie, and Kimiko are now fugitives, and Homelander and Vought are more powerful than ever. But just as the boys are about to leave the country, they are pulled back into the fray. So, yeah. And overall, my, my thoughts on this, it was a, a nice 
big opening, kind of like a an awakening of back those memories of the first season. But it, it's not as extreme when the first season opened up. Because in the first season, we get that first episode, you see Huey's there, he's, and we do get a recap of that where, you know, his girlfriend, he's holding her mm -hmm. hands, and then A-Train blows, blows through her, and we get that whole backstory of what happened in season two. But with this, it didn't open up with a huge bang, but it gave us some, like, kind of like spy Hmm. A, a spy feeling to me when it when it came to the very beginning with Starlight and Huey and how they were interacting and Huey hiding some information from Mother's Milk and Frenchie and where they were staying and what looked to me like some sort of drug gang area. <laughs> they were staying in this place where they were, you know, setting up drugs to be sent out and shipped. And he has to stay in this, like, little, uh, like, kind of like a... a what would you call that? Like a deli or something? Or... Yeah, it was a pawn. It's a pawn shop. You're pawn talking about the, shop? The, 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 yeah. the front. Yeah, the front is a pawn shop for the, okay for the for the drug dealers. Yeah, it's it's they're they're in the basement of a pawn shop. In fact, they say that later. I think it's in episode two or later when they actually say that that we're in the basement of a pawn shop. So yeah, yeah, uh, and they're hiding yeah, away. <laughs> and it's the Haitians. The, the you know they're they're there. Kind of mother's milk is doing the first aid for the Haitians, and Frenchie is selling them weapons. So yeah, there's it's it was a really great the first episode is really it was really great to go back and rewatch it because it reminded me of a lot of things that I forgot and it's a really good setup for the rest of of the season it establishes where all of our characters are it establishes what position they're in you know that that kind of thing so yeah so this first episode is really really important as pivotal yes definitely and with that we should get into our top fives absolutely Hey man. Yeah. Want a fresca? Yeah. Thanks. So I'll start off first, and my number five would be Black Noir's attack on Nakim. I, I guess it was a supervillain, as they quote unquote state, <laughs> as Vought would state, and he goes to basically act as like an assassin. I guess, if you call it. The way he takes him out, uh, we can tell that he doesn't feel anything when he's burned, apparently, or scarred, because you saw his, some of his mask was burnt mm -hmm. off, and, you know, his the tissue on his face was burnt away, his side on his abdomen and chest. So it's really weird, because I guess this guy doesn't have any feeling at all, because yeah, that would make somebody cry out or scream out in some <laughs> way, in my opinion. Yeah. And then, a uh, spoiler about the Black Noir. So, in the comic book, and this is a comic spoiler, so you could shoot ahead a little bit if you want, listeners. But if you guys have read it, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, but basically, Black Noir was in the comic was a clone of Homelander. Huh. And had all of Homelander's abilities. And then takes over as Homelander at some point in the comic when the real Homelander is killed. And he's more villainous or crazy hmm. as that character taking over Homelander's, you know, persona and being Homelander. So I I think within the show, the, the Black Noir is just going to be like a mystery overall. I think that's how they're crediting him for this. So Noir is trying to, and you know, th there, was a there was one scene that was kind of disturbing to me, and I'm pretty sure it was to you, Steve, and maybe some of the listeners. Noir trying to entertain that kid in the bed with a stuffed bunny, but still having, you know, uh, what was it? Nakim's uh, head in his other hand, yeah. <laughs> dripping. Yeah. <laughs> I, was... think, I think that kid is supposed to be maverick supposed to be translucent son i think that's who that kid is supposed to be oh really so, yeah i that's what i'm assuming i can't i can't think of any other family that he would go visit after killing this guy because remember this is the guy that they're giving credit for killing translucent even though we know huey was the one who killed, killed translucent, them. and yep. even homelander knows that the boys he may not know specifically which one of them but he knows the boys killed translucent so, yes. uh, so yeah, that, that is kind of a creepy little scene there, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's supposed to be Translucent Sun Maverick. And I think, you know, Noir, and they've talked about this on other podcasts that I heard about the boys, he's kind of like the Deadpool kind of character. Like, I, I, so he's very different from what you're saying. He's very different from the comic book because he's more of like a, like I said, like a Deadpool type yeah. of character. What, the only thing that confused me about that scene watching it this time was how come only a small portion of his uniform is burned. 
Like, wouldn't you think, like, if any of it's going to be burned, wouldn't all of it burn, you mm. know, or yeah. would more of it, like, I don't understand why just those certain little spots burned when Nakib used his his power. I don't know. That's That was a little confusing to me this time around, but, hey, it's it's all good. It's just a comic book movie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it ain't a show. show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so my number five is just Translucent's funeral. I, I you know, it's, we see, got Starlight singing. We got Deep drinking at that bar and then being being cut off. And he sees one of the pictures that they had uh, of Translucent was actually him. He's like, they cut. That's that's me. That's my shoulder. That's not that's not <laughs> Translucent. And uh, so I thought it was great. And and I wondered uh, the one thing that occurred to me watching it this time was, do you think there was actually anything in the casket at all? Because right when they blew him up and they sent him in that that uh that suitcase or that briefcase that was at the bottom of the ocean that deep found mm -hmm. right or wherever it was it was made out of the only thing that like that's how homelander found it was it was made out of the only thing that that homelander can't see through and so he knew there was something in there for him and so that was the the pieces of translucent's body so i wonder if they actually put those in the casket or if the casket was empty uh just a just a fun little thought that occurred to me well my thought was when i saw that i was like he's not in there they could easily yeah. put an impression of a body and the the uh, it was like it could be memory foam and it could just be there <laughs> and it's yeah. like yeah we got him look exactly you can see the yeah. impression he's not going to be breathing obviously right. so <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so but I just thought that was funny. And like I said, trans I thought the other thing that I didn't put in my notes, but Starlight, what was the deal? Why did she have to have a wig? Was the was the hair that much bigger that she had on on stage? Because, you know, she goes backstage and she takes off the wig and she's got her regular hair underneath it. I was like, it didn't look like the, the wig didn't look all that much bigger or fluffier than her regular hair. So it made that, it more poofier. If you I think guess. about it, okay. it was like their extensions to make it bigger than a little bit bigger than what okay. it is. Okay. Cause when you see her, when she gets to civilian clothes, her hair is straighter. It's very thinner to her face. Whereas okay. when you see her on the, the moving billboard that she takes a quick look at and is like mm -hmm. really you know citizen yeah. starlight and all that okay but you know she she you could see it's a lot poofier and you know and, and accentuates she's wearing a ton of makeup where when she's on the street she wipes down everything from her like a lot of women do they they wind up taking forever taking off that makeup and uh, i would never be able to be a woman <laughs> yeah. or anybody that wears makeup because honestly that that takes a lot of time and i give a lot of women respect for that or guys depending on who you are and what you right. do but you know honestly you know even actors and actresses that that go out there and have to put this stuff on all the time yeah yeah okay so my number four would be <laughs> the deep and his depression of not being part of the seven and being ignored and written off just like you said with the bar scene <laughs> it's like that's not that's my shoulder <laughs> you know his drunken spell in the bar and then the the bartender basically kicking him out another at the water park and being arrested i i think he was doing something a little bit lewd <laughs> in my opinion with the way he had that water gun <laughs> but uh yeah i and then he gets arrested there because of his you know his blowout he's drunk and disorderly he's, he's drunk oh, big and disorderly, time basically yeah. so yeah yeah then another super bails him out and gives him a fresca <laughs> and a way to help himself and we get to see more of this character as the episode continues and he you know he i think he gets the deep involved with therapy and finding mm -hmm. more about himself and that that character is interesting i'm forgetting his name uh, eagle the archer eagle the archer yes yeah yeah because yeah. yeah. yeah, he actually talks about uh, an incident of when he was he did something bad no, it, he what his what his spiral was was that he he responded to a hostage situation like at a grocery store. Yeah, and he didn't have enough arrows. Arrows, yeah. There's only the so many. He, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, so he didn't do anything bad. He just wasn't able to save. Yeah, he wasn't. All the uh, wasn't bad. So, yeah, yeah. It yeah. wasn't a bad. He didn't do a bad thing. He just didn't. He wasn't, and that caused him to spiral down, and that's why the church found him. And you know, he he takes an interesting arc through the season until we get to the end of the. The, the season so it'll be interesting to track that uh, him throughout the the season this this time 
Oh, definitely. Especially Deep. Yeah, yeah, Deep. Yeah. Well, yeah, both of them, Eagle the Archer and Deep, they both take kind of an, an arc in this in this thing, and and uh, and we get to see where Eagle the Archer ends up as well. So. As well as A-Train, too, because A-Train mm-hmm. gets involved with the church as well at a certain point. So, like we yep. said before, spoilers, listeners. Yeah. So, <laughs> we're going to go into Deep Dives a little bit from later episodes, but we will bring those up later on, too, when yeah. we cover this. For sure. All right, so my number four is just the the Billy Joel song "Pressure." You know, it's played at the beginning of the episode. It's played, I think, we hear it a little bit at the end. And uh, you know, I was a huge Billy Joel fan back in the '90s and the the, the mid to late '80s, I think. And so it was it was kind of cool uh, to to hear that. Um, and then I noticed that Huey's wearing a James Taylor shirt uh, at one point in the episode. So he he definitely has this folk kind of rock or kind of slow rock however you whatever you think of these guys that's his kind of his jam it's kind of older because he's definitely not of the generation and i think he talks about it later in the season about why billy joe he's such a fan of billy joel so it's it's really kind of cool to see that music and to see him kind of showing his uh his fandom of that that kind of music yeah just like Huey, though, I grew up and at the time when, you know, Billy Joel was coming around in the late 70s and the 80s and everything when he was mm-hmm. very popular. So I grew up on Billy Joel. I'm, it's ingrained in who my family is and we listen to Billy Joel. And we do see more or hear more Billy Joel within the, uh, the episodes of the season. As oh well. yeah, I'm gonna do a Billy Joel song watch. That's gonna be part of my. There you go. What I do here is is because I think they feature almost a song every episode. Correct. I, I think so. It's gonna be kind of cool to track those as we go through the the season. And the cool arc about that, if you bring up the Billy Joel, is that it kind of gives you that feeling of within the scene too. We see that in the very beginning with Huey, when he's he wakes up. He and you hear the music start, and he's walking through the pawn shop or underneath the pawn shop at that point. At when he's looking at, you know, mother's milk pulling a bullet out of a guy's arm and all that, and it's just the pressure of what he has to deal with on a daily basis. And then at the very end, that ending scene that we get, it plays again. Yeah. So yeah, it has uh, pretty much very importance into what's going on within the scene itself too which we'll go into later because i believe next episode and i think it goes follows through into the next the third episode too, a billy joel song as well yeah like i said i I think there's a different if i remember and there might be one or two where they don't do it but i think almost every episode has got a billy joel song featured but we'll we'll like i said i'm gonna track that as we go along yeah so we're on to what my number three your number three yes sir Okay, so my number three. Well, that would be Ashley's replacement for Translucent. Uh, Blind Spot is shown oh. to Homelander, and Homelander points out that he's useless without his ears. So, and then he smacks the guy in the sides of the head with like some harsh fierceness, and it his ears just start gushing blood. He's screaming on the floor, bleeding out. You know. It just renders him making his ears useless and him stating, without your ears, you're just another useless blind person. The look of fear on Ashley's face was so much that you knew she was not sure of how to deal with these people and how stressful it will be. Oh, yeah. And I had this I had this in my notes because, uh, you know, as we go through the season, we're going to see homelanders kind of racism and his anti handicap stand his his hatred or racism toward non-whites and towards the handicap we're going to see that progress and oh we're yeah gonna see stormfront when she plays on it that whole thing you know we get this extreme nationalism when he's when they're looking at the slogans and he goes no i don't care that that whole room full of people preferred saving the world i want saving america because that's the slogan that i want because the americans are the ones that we're here for for. And so it's it's really, you know, and I didn't pick up on it. I wouldn't have picked up on it in the the first go around because it's it's not subtle, but it's but you definitely see it's going to progress as we go through the rest of the season. Oh, definitely, and you could you could pick it up, and then as soon as we find out what who Stormfront is, mm-hmm. then you exactly. start you know, you're like, wow, okay, this was yeah who she's affiliated and with, and like I said, spoilers everybody, but. You know, eventually you'll find out there's an underlying thing, and I was always suspicious as soon as we saw her. Even in when I my first watch, when I first watched the mm-hmm. the first three episodes, I'm like, there's something up with this chick. She's crazy. 
Yeah, <laughs> you know she's I, too I, out there. You know, I admit, I admit, I was, I was fooled for, I was fooled for at least a, a few episodes, and it didn't until it was, you know, fully revealed in whatever episode three, when we start to see her. I mean, I didn't know the extent of how evil she is, but yeah, no, I was fooled. I'll, I'll admit it. I, they had me, they had me, I was on board with this character. I'm like, this is cool. She's like kind of a rebel. She's, you know, talking against Vought and nobody's saying anything to her. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I, I bought into it. I, I got into it. Okay. So this is my number three. Well, we kind of already talked about it a little bit, but I just want to talk a little bit more about this whole scene at the beginning where we see the boys and we see Huey, you know, he's he's laying in bed and he's watching the Starlight press conference with Homelander on his little phone. And we see that tension, like you already mentioned, between him and Mother's Milk. But I loved that whole, when Huey starts saying, well, maybe I could be the guy who, even though I don't look awesome and I don't do awesome things, but maybe I, you know, awesome things happen because of me. And I kind of hinted at that in the last season, because the last episode of the first season, he does some things that you go, this kid has really got some luck. I mean, he killed Translucent. He <laughs> shoots those guys with the machine gun by just kind of pointing it over his head. Yeah. And, you know, there was kind of a, a lucky factor to him that I was like, maybe he's going to be kind of the, the non-superhero guy who turns out to be awesome. But, you know, that's not going to be the case. But it was kind of cool to see him acknowledging that and, and kind of wanting to aspire to that because he's – and that's another arc that we're going to go through through this season is we're going to see Huey come to the realization that at least at first he's coming to this realization that he has nowhere else to go besides the boys. And then when we get to the end of the season, we're going to see him step out on his own and go, no, it's time for me to step away. Yes. So it's, it's it, 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 the arcs of these characters. I'm really, the more and more I'm thinking about it, the more and more I'm, I'm going to enjoy this kind of slow rewatch of season two because, you know, we kind of blazed through it. Yeah, we were watching it week to week, but only watching it once or maybe watching it twice each week. You didn't get the chance to kind of dive deep into it like we're going to have on this this rewatch. So exactly. I'm kind of excited. When the episodes came out, I would only watch it once. And I then, watched it. I, I watched the episode once and then I would watch it up until I got the answer to the TV podcast interviews. <laughs> then, You're cheating. Would, so, uh, no, you, that's the whole point. Is you listen to the question, you go watch the episode again and get the answer. That's the whole point of it, you know. And uh, so that's what I would do. So I kind of watched them like one and a half times, uh, you know, the first time through. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah, I, usually it became like not. I wouldn't call it you know water cooler talk or anything, but mm. me. And one of the guys I work with, Jason, we got into a whole discussions about it because he was like, did you watch it? And I'm like, yeah. yeah. And then we just talk about it in the truck on the way to a job or on nice. the job, as it were. And we have fun with it. And that's the cool thing. He He's really interested in it. And during a job, he made a comment of something that was going on. It was something strictly out of Billy Butcher's mouth. <laughs> and nice. I said, and the other two guys we worked with were like, wait, what? I'm like, Billy Butcher? And Jesus is like, see, Mark got it. He's watching the boys. Nice. Nice. <laughs> so this becomes like one of those cool shows that you have to watch and only those select few that do watch mm -hmm. it get to talk exactly. about it and have fun with it, you know? Exactly. Yep. So on to my number two. Your number two. And that would be Gecko using his powers to get thrills out of anyone that wants to cut off pieces of him Ugh. or his limbs. Uh, some sort of twisted sexual uh, BDSM thing that he does fantasy for for people for money. And, the you know, that guy was just hacking at that arm and <laughs> it was Ugh. just like so sick. And Starlight filming it and that's her way of trying to use that as leverage to get what she needs out of Vought because... You know, Gecko works in, even though he's a nobody there, but he's able to get what she wants, which is Compound V. And, you know, and the, the one thing that he does, he says at the very end of that particular scene, an extra gun and you could cut off my penis. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that, that was really creepy. Yeah. And the guy's like, where's where's the nearest UTM? Yeah, I had this in my notes also with with Gecko and just that we we get to we're seeing a side of Starlight that we didn't see in the first season. And again, I'm going to I keep coming back to this. We're going to see these character arcs 
throughout this season yeah. because she uses that video to blackmail him. And But even then, when they're talking in the diner, she just sounds like she is so disillusioned and that she's just given up on any nobody's good. Everybody does bad things. And it just it, it hurt me a little bit to see that Starlight has kind of lost this, you know, the the brightness and the positivity that she kind of had in the first season and that she kind of got from Huey. And, and so it's, it's uh yeah, it's another character arc that we're going to see her go through. And even when she gets close to the end of the season, we're going to see her turn to some kind of dark, dark stuff. Yeah. So my number two is we already talked again, a little bit about Eagle, the archer, but uh, I want to kind of talk a little bit about this and the church of the collective. We don't have it called that in this episode. We don't actually see it until the next episode when deep is filling out that little workbook he has, but this, this whole idea of this cult that this woman and she's like, no, I'm not a, I, what did he say? I think he said therapy and she said, no, it's not therapy. It's something else. And then the whole Fresca thing, which I don't think if I remember correctly, the Fresca thing doesn't even get explained anywhere, anywhere at all, but it comes up season. so much though. <laughs> Almost every episode we got somebody from the church to collect You want a Fresca? Like no, even a deep mean? with, with a train. Yeah. yeah. You want a Fresca? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I didn't even know they, I didn't even know Fresca was still around, you know, but anyway, that's yeah. a whole other thing. I guess they bought, they must have bought some advertising here. <laughs> but, <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's really kind of cool, but of course she tempts him with the, the fact that she can get him back into the seven. And then there's that whole line when, when Eagle is, is kind of making his statement to Deep, you can see her in the background mouthing the words. So you can definitely tell that, that what Eagle is saying is what he's been told to say or what he's been programmed to programmed, say. Programmed, yeah. How, yeah, however you want to put it with cults, you know, it just well, it's so, whew. yeah. That's what this is, is pretty much like almost like a little cult that they could manipulate whatever soup that they need to do what, for whatever yeah, they need, exactly. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And on to my number one. Yes. That quick. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that would be the introduction, uh, the actual introduction of Stormfront. You know, she is just over the top and we find out a lot about her later on and her underlying, you know, causes like or what she's there for. And she's brought into the Seven without Homelander's approval, which really pisses him off in some mm -hmm. ways, you know. Ashley went over his head with the uh, with with the CEO Edgar right. by doing this. No, no, it, no. Stan oh, Edgar, this was Edgar. Yeah, yeah this, no, this was, was Edgar. Edgar all by himself. Yeah, she had. Yeah, Ashley had nothing to do with Stormfront. And then actually, Homelander confronts Edgar about this. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and it's that's a crazy. That's another one of those crazy scenes where we've never seen Homelander back down from somebody. Yeah, yeah, and, and he it shows back down. He kind of backs down. So, and it shows that how the CEO doesn't really care for him. He's like, I don't mm -hmm. care for what you think. This, you know, I'm in charge. Right. It's like he's a true puppet master of these soups, and he knows what the hell he's doing. And, you know, Madeline was just there originally to control the soups from what we know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with Stormfront, uh, not Stormfront, uh, Homelander confronting Edgar, it, you know, you, you see that, and he backs down. And that, and I just love Giancarlo Esposito. He was yeah. great as the CEO of Vought. And listeners, if you don't remember him, you will remember him when I say Breaking Bad. <laughs> and he was he, he's such a great actor, too. And yeah. we can also see him coming at the end of October in The Mandalorian, if you remember. Yes. So, yes. you know, keep look out for uh, Giancarlo Esposito. That was all of your number one? Yes. Okay. Uh, so my number one is just we get the first head-popping scene. I totally forgot that this was in episode one. I yeah. thought this was in episode two. So I was not I was totally not expecting it when I saw the scene start. And I was like, wait a minute. This is the head-popping scene. And when we see Rainer's head explode. Yep. And now, it, again, spoiler full. So if you, have not, <laughs> if you have not watched all the way through to episode eight, I am sorry. I'm going to spoil something for you. We That's find huge. Out in episode Episode eight, that Councilwoman Newman is the one who's popping heads. And I would I would have loved for them in episode eight to have like shown us 
at least given us like her perspective on this scene or on the scene in the boardroom or something to, to kind of show, uh, I wish they maybe next season we'll get it and they'll, they'll kind of, you know, recap it for us and show us because this is the, like, I understand she's actually in the room there mm -hmm. at the end, but where was she at in this scene? How did she know what Rainer was saying? How did she, you know, what was she doing? Was she on a building somewhere with one of those, voice things did she have a, a bug on rainer yeah. i don't know i kind of want to know how she knew rainer was about to give this up and so she popped popped her head but uh, <laughs> but yeah it just uh, it blew me away with seeing it again uh for the very first time in this episode because i was like oh man yeah Kenny's councilwoman newman was around and what was cool is and obviously this is something you would only notice on a rewatch because you've already watched the whole season is immediately after that head popping scene it cuts to the next scene and we have Councilwoman on Newman, news. yeah on the on the tv screen so there was some <laughs> foreshadowing there if we had known or if we would have picked up on it there was kind of foreshadowing there of uh, of what she was gonna do yeah Exactly. And I wonder how close she has to be in the vicinity with the person to do that with her powers, you know? Yeah, line of sight, or can she just think about it? Yeah, I, I, I'd be interested to know some answers about that. And the fact that we know now, and we, we find out more later on about Vought and how it's been issued out so many places around the world. So even within America itself, you had people who have these powers because whoever took in as an experiment or something they obtain these powers but never were brought in as a soup it's only when they start to expose themselves i guess through social media or mm -hmm. you know doing things on their own that vaught seeks them out to be possible recruitments for their uh their seven or whatever you want to call their their company itself as what they're doing with soups and plus, I want to add on to that with what you said, Steve. You know, the actress that played Susan Rayner was Jennifer Esposito. Mm -hmm. And she has always played law enforcement in many movies and films. So with the she's like the FBI. And I always think she is like a typecasted for these characters, as it were, as an actor or actress. But she's always great at them, too. So mm -hmm. I thought she fit perfectly in it. And you could see her in you know, such shows as NCIS Blue Bloods, and if you remember Taxi, the movie with Jimmy Fallon and Queen Latifah. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah That's kind of so, cool. Yeah. She, she always plays these kind of characters. So, mm -hmm. And she's a really good actress, too. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got some notes here. Yes. Uh, I'll start off with the first one. Uh, that would be the capitalizing on the soups. All the shirts, like the plates, glassware, everything. Anything with an image of the soups is on everything plastered all over the place we see that more so now in this episode than any other episode like the comic books that huey passes in the pawn shop as he's walking out you could see them on comic books that they have mm -hmm. we see it more as they leave translucent's funeral mm -hmm. and you see everybody with a eight by ten glossy and they want it signed like you're at a convention or something Plus, you can see the guy that's like, oh, yeah, you got two for $74. I'm like, really? That's a lot of money for two yeah. T-shirts of something that you just printed yourself, pal. But mm -hmm. they had everything, and I saw you saw that, too. It was something for Translucent's uh, funeral. It was like a, a dish, like da dinner mm -hmm. set wear or something like yeah, that. Yeah, gone but not forgotten, the slogan. Yeah, or exactly. Something, or, not see, or not seen but not forgotten or something like that. Yeah. I can't remember how it, how it was. Gone seen. but yeah, not seen or something. Yeah. Yeah, we just see a glass of an image of a soup during the noir scene as well. Like when uh, the woman is, I, I think her throat gets cut or something, mm -hmm. and you see the blood dripping down or drip falling down into the glass itself, filling it. And I don't know if it was Nakim, his image that was on it, or if it was a popular soup. I couldn't really get a really right. good good look at it. But I think it was Nakim. I'm really yeah. not sure. Well, in that whole thing, in that whole scene, you know, the beginning of that scene before Noir comes in the room, they're like, they're like looking at T-shirts of Nakeem. Yes. They're, they're kind of, what's your slogan going to be? What's your, what's your, you know, your catchphrase going to be? And he's like, burn in truth. That'll be my, my catchphrase. Cause he says something first and the other guy's like, no, that's too long. It's got to be shorter. And yeah. so, you know, he, he sees that and he only, he only gets to say it once. He says it to Noir and then Noir cuts his head off. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, really, really cool. Um, let's see. We've talked about 
out some of mine already. Homelander heating up and then drinking Stonewell's uh, breast milk from the the fridge. Uh, this whole this is another one of those things that we're going to see. Oh, we're going to see later on again. There's uh, some even more, more major creepy, creepiness. Yeah, more creepy stuff going on with Homelander. Yeah, definitely. My other note would be Kimiko is learning English apparently, and it seems that Huey is teaching her with uh, grade school books. And we see her practicing her writing within a book itself, like her B's and everything, mm-hmm. getting letters out. So it's her way of trying to learn more. Yeah. And it, and eventually, uh, later on, actually, I got into a discussion with my friend Jason about this. He and I were talking about her learning or knowing sign language and then Frenchie's starting to learn himself because he wants to be able to communicate with her. Right, he but loves remember, her so it's, much. Not, it's not – actual sign language it's their personal it's like a private one yes. she and her brother did it's not the the real sign language uh that's out there so that's why Frenchie doesn't know it and that's why he can't he's got to get taught it so yeah really really cool one of my other ones that we haven't talked about is Kamiko finding that origami little folded up thing and i'm sure mm-hmm. that was the moment when she realized her brother was the one who was the soup with the with the telekinesis power and yep. you know i love that she's trying to explain it to Frenchie and she can't because she doesn't know the word brother. So she's yes. like, boy, girl, boy, girl. And it's not going to be till the next episode that we're going to see the reveal of that it's her brother. But uh, but yeah, that was really, really cool. I, I did not notice that the first time around. So seeing her find that little folded up piece of paper, I was like, oh, that's how she, why she was saying these things or trying to convince the guys of these things. Hmm. Very true. Last one I would have would be the reenactment of Madeline Stillwell's quote unquote murder by Billy and as being the murderer which he wasn't technically it was mm-hmm. Homelander that burns through her eye sockets and then Billy is just happens to be one that you know blows up the house and right. oddly enough that the the baby shows up alive what miles away I'm glad you mentioned that because that was the big thing I remember at the beginning of the season, I, catching that on the newscast. That I was really glad that we got to hear that the baby survived because yes. that that was a that was a thing that that we didn't know at the end of last season because it was so dark. And I was like, man, if Homelander killed that baby, that's crazy, you know. But no, he didn't. So I, <laughs> I wonder if that baby's going to come into play later. If it's just now because Stillwell's gone and. Everything else is pushed aside, so probably won't. We probably won't get any other mention of it. But yeah, I'm glad you bring that up. Yeah, the last one I've got here that we haven't already talked about is just that Stan Edgar, when he's talking to Homelander, he mentions some of the first superheroes when he's talking about Vought, and he mentions Soldier Boy. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was that's kind of cool because uh, because of some spoilers we'll talk about when we get to the news section. Yes, and for quotes, I only have one. You already pretty much mentioned it, but it would be Nakeem going maybe. Quote unquote, by the power of my holy fire. And then his friend goes, That's too wordy. We want a catchphrase that is catchy. And then he goes, How about burning truth? Mm-hmm. He goes, Oh, that is a good catchphrase. And that, you know, that was, and that was before they got killed. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I'm glad you wrote that out because I couldn't remember what the long phrase was that he was trying to think. Oh, that's the last thing I had is just that, that, that last moment we get of Butcher's back. And, and, you know, I didn't write any quotes down, but maybe the, maybe the biggest one of this, of this whole episode is Butcher saying, Daddy's home. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> he definitely can. is back. So <laughs> Butcher's back. <laughs> Now we should move on to episode two. Sure. Where should I start? Are you ready to meet the newest member of the seven? See it here first. WFAK. KMFT. WDCS. She's the newest member of the seven, and she's taking America by storm. From Portland to Seattle, watch what comes next. KMFT. Amazing. Do you want to give the... Absolutely. So season two, episode two is proper preparation and planning. The synopsis that IMDb gives us is that Butcher is back with the boys, but tensions flare with Huey. Homelander spends quality time with his new family. Starlight and Stormfront bond at a press junket and the boys hunt down a super terrorist with a startling identity. These, you know, it's nice to see some of these not giving away too much. Yes. 
sometimes these IMDb synopses can be super spoilery. And uh, so it, I would have, I would have not been surprised for the synopsis to say, you know, finding out that the super terrorist is Kimiko's brother. I would not have been surprised at all <laughs> for that to come. But in general, you know, I really like th this second episode. Again, it's a, it's another one that I really enjoyed watching. There's a lot setting up for the next episode. And really buying us in because I think it's going to be episode four. It's either going to be episode three or four when maybe it is the end of episode three when we see Stormfront and we, we get to find out how evil she really is. And we get to see that that little the kind of back and forth between her and Homelander kind of starts in, the, in that third episode. So there's a lot of things that episode two is setting up for us going down the rest of the season. Oh, definitely. Hey, man. Want a fresca? Thanks. So we should head into our top fives. Absolutely. Actually. So my my number five is just at the beginning, that beginning flashback with Butcher and finding out that he's left in front of that that restaurant by by Homelander. And we don't know. We're not going to find out until later why Homelander kept him alive. But I just I, I loved him trying to remember everything he could about that house and coming in there and, and getting a crayon and. and picking up that that piece of paper and writing as much as he could he's like the trees the the size of the house the kind of area all that kind of stuff but of course we, it's perfect timing that his picture pops up on the tv screen and yeah. with a super clear picture of him and he looks exactly the same <laughs> as he does and so he has to get out of there right away yeah hence why his he he shows up in some sort of like jogging gear <laughs> yeah. i guess yeah. at the pawn shop you know <laughs> But yeah, that would be my number five as well. You know, seeing Billy where he, where Homelander drops him off, which is like, I guess in Fort Wayne, because he didn't know exactly what state he was in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, him writing down what the, the house looked like so he doesn't forget it so he could get back there. And then, of course, the news broadcast. And, you know, yeah. and then, of course, you know, he had to get out of there because the girl at the restaurant's like, looks at the screen, looks at him, and he's out the door. Yep. Uh, so my number four is just that whole drug trip of of deeps. Uh, you know, e Eagle the Archer says he's not going to drink the whatever it was. I don't know if it's ayahuasca or mushrooms or what it was that he was he was drinking because it's Deep's journey to take. And then we get Patton Oswalt. I was so like it was so fun to hear yeah. Patton Oswalt as the voice of of Deep's gills. I and, love uh, that. <laughs> yeah, you needed a comedian of that caliber to do that. Though. Be a little bit that snarky, sarcastic kind of talking to him. Exactly. Exactly. I love how he's. Listening Listening to the Goo Goo Dolls, and he turns off the music as when he starts to hear that voice, and then he looks down, and he sees his gills talking to them. I love that the gills are are speaking with themselves in the third person. They're saying "us," you know. Uh, it's just really, it, it's it's just a fun fun kind of scene. Um, but you know, it, it's kind of interesting that that it really kind of helps him out a little bit. He does get something out of this therapy and that he realizes that he needs to not be ashamed of his body, not be ashamed of his gills and, and be happier. And we also learn that his real name is Kevin. Yes. And that would take me to my number four. And it would be Homelander trying to get to his son, Ryan. You know, he's trying to be the father, but yeah, you know, this is his manipulation of trying to get Rebecca to give him more time with his boy. I don't think he really is invested in the kid. I think Homelander is afraid of the kid. And this came up with a conversation with my friend Jason about this. He and I believe that the kid is far more stronger than Homelander. And that's why Homelander is afraid of him. So the kid could literally kill Homelander if he wanted to. So I think that's why if you look at the course of the season... And him trying to help out or train the kid or manipulate him in some way is as if like what the company was doing with Homelander and manipulating mm -hmm. him. So he's trying to do it for his own needs as well. Also to stop the kid from killing him because he's already seen what would happen if he lashes out at people or something. Interesting theory. Yeah, that, that would be kind of interesting to know whether Ryan is stronger than Homelander or, you know, if maybe just, maybe he won't be stronger than Homelander until he gets older, maybe. So that is, that is an interesting theory. I don't know if we're going to get to see it played out or not but with Ryan being as young as he is. Yes. So we'll have to, we'll just have to see. And of course now, we, you know, he's not in the picture at the moment. So I don't even know if we're going to get him in season three or not. So that's, that's an interesting theory though. I, I hadn't thought about, I hadn't thought about it that way that, that Homelander might be a little bit uh, kind of frightened, but yeah, it, it definitely was cool 
it was also really cool to see Homelander admit when he, you know, toward at the end of the episode, he admits to Ryan that all the stuff he was telling him was untrue. He goes, yeah, my dad used to play catch with me with a World Series ball, you know, assigned by Lee Carson and uh, and all this. And then at the end, he's like, he admits, you know, uh, no, none of that actually happened. That was all just made up. And we knew that in the first season, remember, they showed that mock-up of the house where when they were doing that little documentary of him. And he's like, why is that blanket in there? Because that blanket was the only real thing that was in the house and he got rid of it because he didn't want to be reminded of the reality of his childhood. He yes. wanted the illusion of his childhood. And so very interesting. Uh, so that brings us to my number three. Yes. I, I just love the whole press junket with uh, about the seven movie and it's got starlight Maeve, <laughs> uh, and, and storm for at least Maeve for a little while there. And, you know, Maeve gets that call about Elena and she goes, I've got a family emergency and she runs to the elevator and then Stormfront tries to go, I have a family emergency too, but it didn't, didn't work for her. You know, <laughs> she's still there. Um, you know, it's just, it's just like, we see these kind of things in real life all the time and you never, I, you rarely see it from the perspective of the actors that they're getting the exact same questions. They're getting the exact same responses. They're saying the exact same things to all these different people. And mm -hmm. it's different. Like, and Ashley's like, and you've got two o'clock is the international ones and all of this. And I, I loved them kind of trying to ambush her ambush starlight with a train kind of jumping out that he's out of his coma. Mm -hmm. Um, and then later, A Train catching her with the with the compound V, and again we see this kind of dark side of Starlight, where she basically blackmails A Train and saying, "Well, if you <laughs> if you don't let me have this compound V, I'm going to tell everybody that you murdered Popclaw, and I've got the proof of it because I've got the the." Um, what do you call that? The autopsy report. And there's no way she could have shoved all those needles into her arms at the same time. And one of them broke the bone and all this kind of thing. And it's one of those things that I think even later in the, the season, I think she comes back again because a train again tries to say something. And she's like, well, now you're in too deep because now if I'm going to tell everybody that you knew that I had the compound V. And so we just, Again, it's just this uh, this descent of Starlight into darkness that I wonder what we're going to see in the next season with her, if she's going to come back to her positivity or if she's going to stay with this uh, kind of darkness. Hmm. Good call. Mm -hmm. Well, my number three, you already topped on and talked about, but I have to agree with you completely. The deep trip on psychedelics and, you know, he has to take a... a journey into his own brain and have that little conversation with his gills uh that whole scene was just trippy i just love it <laughs> very cool so my number two is just seeing the we as we see that aerial shot of the walls around becca and ryan's compound it's kind of like a truman show kind of thing going on i totally missed this the the first time I, I watched these through and it wasn't until I listened to TV podcast uh, industries and they talked about this that I went, Oh, that's what's going on there. Cause and like they reveal and we see that she drives to the gate, but it's not a gate to go in somewhere. It's a gate to go out. Mm -hmm. And then she talks to the doctor on the phone. And the thing that, that, that bugged me though, watching it through this time and seeing it is, you know, if, if he has a piano teacher, that means they have people within those gates who are, are specifically there to kind of make him think it's authentic. So yeah. how come they didn't recruit some people, some families to be his friends? Why didn't they have him in like a small, you know, one room schoolhouse or something like that to where he was with people? His Like it just, it, it doesn't, it, there's a disconnect for me. The fact that why would they have this piano teacher, but not have, anybody anybody else why wouldn't well, they if they're going to have socialization with this piano teacher why wouldn't they have socialization i you know? think they have families around because you, you see more houses around there within that overlook so i wouldn't be surprised if they had other families maybe they kept him separated because of his powers maybe they knew the fact that you know he is homelander's child just, he could be a yeah. little bit dangerous so him and around other kids and he'll lash out. So that that's the only thing I yeah, could I could think it, of that would cause them to do something like that. Kind of how they treated Homelander too as a child. Remember? They, but that's what I, I that's what I'm saying is it, you would think that they would have corrected their mistakes with Homelander and they would have created like 
because we get the impression later on in the season when he sees the fact that this is this compound that he lashes out as his mom and he goes, well, you're just lying to me. I wish, I guess, again, it's one of those things that I'm saying. I wish they had shown us more yeah. of this, yeah. of his life in this compound, because I get that, that they could take him up in the air and show him that, Hey, you're living in this walled community and everybody who's your friend, who are your friends is a lie. I, I wanted them to show us more. I wanted them to show us more of his existence in that compound because the way they made it seem like was that the only people that he interacted with was his mom and mm. his piano teacher. Very I, true. I, I needed them to show me more of more. what was going on yeah, so I that it. I could believe I could be, it's more believable that, that he's going to be so upset when he finds out that it's all a lie. Maybe you know, they had filmed it. Maybe they just, because yeah. of budgetary and time. Maybe there's some deleted scenes or something Possibly. That, that show it. You know, maybe they just decided it wasn't something that we needed. Uh but anyway, yeah, it was just it was just a little thing. Yeah. So that would lead me to my number two, and that would be Butcher getting Grace back into the fold with the idea that he quote unquote knows who killed Susanna Reina, even though <laughs> he, he <doesn't>. really doesn't, <laughs> but it's his way of like because when he when he approached Grace in the parking garage, she was ready to, like, tell all... She goes, I'm just going to go across the street to that, whatever it was, a church or something, and tell the 26 F uh, agents that are out there <laughs> about you being here. And then he pleads with her and then goes on and, and he goes, what? You think I killed her? And that was supposed to be about Madeline. And, right. yeah, and then he tries to correct it. And, of course, that's what the first thing he she thought was is that, you know, Butcher killed her. But, you know, he kind of worms his way of having her get back into the fold of helping out which is really cool because you know she is the one that trained but billy to do what he does yeah i love that that she sees that that edible arrangement at the funeral and she knows that that that's billy and so when she gets to the car she knows he's in the back seat and she's like i taught you i literally taught you this move you know and so he just sets up in the back okay you got me uh, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah that was really cool so my number one is just the reveal. We've kind of already talked about it, that the soup terrorist is Kamiko's brother. I love it that Frenchie is the one who puts it together when he sees their reunion. He realizes that, oh, the boy girl thing was brother sister. And, you know, we get this idea. They haven't told us yet that that they have their own kind of version of a of a sign language. But then she finds out that he's been basically radicalized by shining light. And he's actually there. He is there as a super terrorist to attack America, to kill Americans because of what they did to shining light. And she, you know, then he attacks her and she ends up choking him out just before the boys catch up to them and throw him in the van. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a, an interesting scene, the, the chase scene though. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll go into that. It's in my notes, but we'll bring it up now for the fact that when they chase uh, Kimiko's brother through, they it's almost like uh, a party city where they have mm -hmm. like costumes and everything, but there's all this stuff. Everything is a costume of a soup. They have standees. Everything's getting blown out of the way, and they destroy that place like crazy. I just thought that was a funny scene mm -hmm. to see, especially Frenchie following her through everything as well. So I thought that was pretty cool, the top on top of that. My number one, you already mentioned it with A-Train coming back, but while on the set, while Stormfront and, and Starlight were doing all their campaigning, as it were, for Vought about being, you know, uh, of course Maeve wasn't there, but that's who was supposed to be there for, you know, three women being within the seven. So now mm -hmm. they're kind of evening it out. Everything was about girl power, every, you know, and they were trying to push this and, you know, they kept pressuring Starlight. Are you single? Yes, I'm single. Yes, I'm single. Da, 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 da. And you could see Stormfront going, what? Uh, okay. Yeah. Something's not right there. You know, and then A-Train calling her out at her place because after that, uh, before that, there was this exchange of the compound V because she hit it in her boot and then Stormfront, she tried to hide it from Stormfront and then... When well, Storm no, that's, that's that convenient. She didn't put it in her boot because she realized that A-Train saw her. So she had it in her, she was holding it in her and, hand yes. and, and Stormfront had, I've got this in my notes, Stormfront kind of conveniently left her bag there hanging on the, the chair. So she's able to stuff it in to Stormfront's bag mm -hmm. there before A-Train checks her boot. And yeah. I did notice when you see, when you see Stormfront 
come and get that bag and she throws it over her shoulder. As she's walking away, you can see the little pink pouch sticking out of one of the pockets of her bag. So we yes. do know for sure that that's what Starlight did with it. Was she put it into Stormfront's bag and then later she's going to retrieve it from uh, a train said bag. No, Starlight's going to retrieve it from the bag and then and then a train find it comes to her place yes. and sees her with the pouch and takes it from her yes. and then she takes it back from him so yeah and then gonna... yeah yeah and then it goes into that whole scene that we you already talked about mm-hmm. but you know the fact that we do see starlight grow a set of balls i'm sorry <laughs> saying it that way but she did she she was like ready to call him out put out all the information she would just go to the media and state exactly what happened to Popclaw, what he did to drive her to do those things and that he was the cause how he's been using compound v the fact that she was just like all right she could just be as dark as the rest of them you know yeah. these soups which yeah. makes me think you know it's like out of everybody you know butcher we know he's he's a sob <laughs> mm-hmm. he's he's dark and evil Huey's not so innocent himself. Neither is Starlight. A lot of the, obviously, all the soups have like something, you know, dirty laundry. And the only two people that I really enjoy throughout the series that I think are really decent people overall, regardless of the misdeeds that they're doing, would be Frenchie and Mother's Milk. Mm-hmm. They're really, you know, especially Frenchie, he has a true heart to himself. Just look at the way he, he, he reacts to Kimiko, how he loves her and does everything. And then Mother's Milk, and he just loves his kids and he misses them. You know, he got really upset when they, she, he was told that his daughter was starting soccer or something. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it, yeah it, it's just like he lost a lot of what was going on in his life. Well, yeah, and he's putting together that he's putting together that little house for his daughter so that he yeah. can give it to her, and th- that's his way of connecting with her. So, yeah, yeah, for sure, it's it's you definitely hadn't even ever thought about it until you bring that up, but yeah, Frenchie and Mother's Milk are really the purest of intentions here. Yeah, you know, and even Huey, Huey kind of is, but at the same time, Huey's starting to go down a path as well. So. Interesting. So we've got a, a few notes here. Mm-hmm. Let me uh, let me say my, we have already talked about Grace. There we saw the the giant poster on the wall of Maeve with the Saving America slogan. I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> and we learned that Maeve's real name or her name in real life is Maggie Shaw because mm-hmm. that's what she says to Elena. She says Maggie Shaw is still your emergency contact. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we find out her real name. Yeah. Yeah, even though Homelander doesn't really have a real name, if you right. think about it. No, he doesn't. We have not heard one anyway. So yeah. Well, I have a couple. The multiple takes make me laugh on promoting Stormfront on TV. You can mm-hmm. see how much she just can't stand Vought, even though she's part of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our Billy Joel watch for this this week is the the <laughs> mo- the song Second Wind, and we also get a glimpse of the the original video, the music video for it that was shown. Yep, which my brother and cousins were in that video when they filmed it for uh, Second Win for Billy Joel when it originally came out for its his greatest hits album, which very cool wasn't even uh, a the, you know he wanted to put an original track so he did that one song recorded it they filmed it on Staten Island at Tottenville High School and it was the graduation scene so my cousins Larry and Christine were in there as well as my brother and I think my sister was there too because they wanted other graduates so they had an open roll call and it was just the them just in the audience and then they throw up their you know hats and everything but they had an overall shot so they were there and I, I thought that was pretty cool yeah, and I and I love that song. You know, it's one of those it was one of those odd songs. I when it initially came out and I was a kid, I thought it was going to be an original song on an original album. I didn't mm-hmm. realize it was on a greatest hits album. <laughs> hmm. uh, lastly, what I have would be Talking Heads ending out the episode with Huey getting slugged by Billy. <laughs> you know, a psycho killer playing as the episode and scene fades away. Billy telling Huey not to get in the way of him and his old lady. <laughs> yeah. I was really glad that he went with, went back, got back into the van. I, I was glad, glad that mother's milk kind of called out to him uh, to get him back in the van. Uh, I've got a couple more that we haven't already talked about. And uh, that's just that uh, more foreshadowing of the way Stormfront. you know, we see the cracks or we see the character flaws that Stormfront is going to be able to use to kind of get into Homelander when he's 
talking to Ryan, we're, we already mentioned in the first episode, we're kind of seeing his racism and his, um, you know, his anti-disability people with disabilities and non-whites but here he talks to ryan about the fact that they're gods and that they're so much better than everyone else and that they deserve something better that that ego is really starting to get trumped up and what we're going to see later is we're going to see stormfront is going to start to stroke uh, poor choice of words there she's going to stroke <laughs> that ego um more and more as he gets he gets worse and worse throughout the season uh mm -hmm. and then the last one was i Again, it's one of those things that I would only have noticed on this rewatch is that she really has a, a way of hiding her age because mm. she would have never I mean, she she may have dressed up like Pippi Longstocking as a child, but there were not Disney princesses that kids were dressing up as for Halloween exactly. when she was when she actually was a kid. So she's learned to kind of adopt these things and kind of fool other people and so that people don't know her actual age that she's actually a hundred years old. And, you know, I, and we already talked about it with episode one, with her introduction, I was fooled right up until the next episode where we see her reaction to Kamiko's brother and see what she does in that, in that building mm -hmm. that I, I was totally, like I said, I was, I was on board with this character and then suddenly you go, Oh no, she actually is evil. <laughs> yeah. She's not just a rebel. And we're going to find out as we go through the season, even worse. Yeah. She has ulterior motives. And to add on a little bit more, uh, we already spoke about the spoke about the song second wind by Billy Joel. And we hear Huey or we see Huey listening to the song on his phone, iPhone or whatever it is several times, but. If you think about the song itself, the song was based upon suicide and getting better for yourself. So if you think about it when Huey's listening to the song, it's him trying to move on to get better for himself because of everything that's going on around him. So I think that song is very important and we'll see it later on, especially when he talks about Billy Joel and his love of Billy Joel and why he loves Billy Joel. So we've got a couple of quotes here. Uh, I'll give one of mine first. Uh, uh, I, I love at the beginning when they're talking to Billy Butcher and and he's talking about what he's going to go. He's going to go see somebody and he says to Huey, you'll love it. And <laughs> Huey says, I won't love it. I never love it. <laughs> I have one that would be, yeesh, if it vibrates any faster, that stick up our ass will explode. <laughs> and that was Stormfront about Ashley when she runs down everything to Maeve, Starlight, and Stormfront that they have to do. And you could see the stress and Ashley in the scene. And no wonder you start to see her pull her hair out <laughs> towards the end yeah. of the season. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I had my last two were, were they're both Stormfront quotes. And that's when she's talking to Starlight and she says, you're like the vaudiest Vought in all Vought. <laughs> I just, and then when she's talking about Pippi Longstocking and she's talking about what, uh, what Starlight should have done. Cause obviously she knows what happened between Starlight and, the and the deep in the first season uh she says pippi longstocking would bite a d <laughs> so i thought that was uh uh you know if someone shoves it in your mouth you bite it off uh, yep <laughs> yeah uh. so we have no feedback this week but we do have a bit of news and i think you put some in absolutely yeah and this is this is possibly this is going to be a little spoilery if you're if you don't pay attention to social media. So if you want to, if you don't want to be spoiled for season three of the boys, which we have confirmed, we don't know when they're going to start filming. We don't know any of that, but we do have one confirmation for it. So if you want to skip ahead about 30 seconds, if you don't want to hear it, I will let you do that now. So it has been confirmed that there will be a season three of the boys and that Jensen Eccles has announced that he will be portraying soldier boy. We don't know what that entails we don't know if it's going to be a flashback if it's going to be the same character from the comics we don't know anything about it we just know that jensen ackles will be portraying soldier boy in season three awesome and i really am looking forward to seeing jensen ackles in this too i did enjoy him even though i didn't really watch much of supernatural but i do enjoy him as an actor i loved what he did in that show it would be cool if uh was it adrian padalecki if he actually shows up too you know Jared. Jared, Jared, Jared. Like, all right, I got. Yeah, I know I get yeah. the name wrong. Yeah, but yeah, it would be cool. I, I really, and there was always that rumor about Jeffrey Dean Morgan jumping on because he knows the, uh, I guess the creators of the boys for. Uh, well, yeah, Eric Kripke. Eric Kripke is the is the creator of Supernatural. 
as well as the creator of The Boys. Yeah, so, so. He, he showed interest in that, so it'd be awesome to see if we get Jeffrey D. Morgan there as well. Yeah. But to move on, we got a little bit of comic news, and that will be, well, New York City Comic Con is on this weekend. As we record, today is Saturday. Uh, that would be the 10th of October. And I didn't really get to see much. I've been working like crazy, as well as editing a lot of podcast this week too that you got to hear early this week so i was able to get out on a podcast uh at least monday tuesday and wednesday and uh that was a triumphant feat and that wasn't just panels to pixels that was also adrenaline cinema too so i had fun this uh past week doing that and then i had to have a day of rest at least when i got home from work and then i passed out last night really <laughs> early but regardless we have new york comic-con and that's going on now. You can see all the panels. They start usually around Thursday. So today's Saturday. That goes into the weekend. I'm pretty sure if you have not watched it, you could catch on it. And they have a YouTube channel. And you could check all the panels out as they release them on YouTube. Because they are free. A lot of what's going on with these virtual cons, those panels are free. So there's stuff there for like The Walking Dead. They did a whole... And I, I love the fact that we finally got a trailer for Invincible. So we got to see the the trailer for the Invincible cartoon series that's coming out that Seth Rogen's part of. There is a lot of stuff that's going on with Star Trek, or uh, apparently with the Star Trek panel for Discovery and Lower Decks. There were a lot of dislikes, apparently, for one day before the actual panel came on because a lot of people were not happy with it. And then apparently they just disappeared. And I guess somebody was editing them. And then somebody made a comment saying, uh, this had a ton of dislikes and nobody likes it. And they didn't have that many people viewing, apparently. But I actually got to watch Lower Decks a little bit, and I thought it was okay. It was interesting and funny. So uh, my recommendation to those people who are naysayers, just give it a shot. You know, Trek can't be all serious all the time. So, but just like everybody else, I'm just going to, I intend on watching these YouTubes as they come out because I did miss a bunch. So I recommend the uh, New York Comic Con, Fandemic ones that are out there. That's the new thing for Walker Stalker. Well, not Walker Stalker itself, but since Walker Stalker is no longer, you could watch all the Walking Dead stuff on those as well. So I, I recommend that. So now we should move on to podcast recommendations. So what do you have, Steve? Absolutely. Um, Strange Indeed with Rima and Paik. They are going to be covering The Haunting of Bly Manor on Netflix. I sent, I just sent in my voicemail for the first episode. They are going to be watching one episode a week of The Haunting of Bly Manor. So if you're interested in that, check it out. They also do something that and we need to start doing this, Mark. We keep forgetting, or at least I keep forgetting. I don't know if he forget it or just, but they, they have a spoiler post. They have a post on their Facebook page for every episode since they've already all dropped so people can put their their feedback into each individual episode even though they haven't watched it yet and so then they don't get spoiled about it because they don't look at those those posts until it's time to watch the episode might ah. be interesting might be a thought to do for the boys going forward but uh, but yeah so check out strange indeed with Raymond Pake, uh, haunting of Bly manor on netflix and also tv podcast industries will be continuing their coverage of lovecraft country i think they have two episodes of that left. I think I just saw a post from Derek saying that they got their screener for the penultimate episode this weekend. So awesome. That'll be that'll be out on Sunday, and then the last episode will be next Sunday. Oh, cool. And I send I send voicemails to them as well. All right. Well, I only have two this week. Uh, first one would be Michael Rosenbaum, and I've mentioned it before, but the most recent episode of Inside of You, they talk to Dax Shepard, and they go into Dax's falling out of sobriety for like a moment and what he went through and going through and getting inside the details of Dax and how he, you know, how it affected his marriage with uh, Kristen, and I thought it was a really good podcast. I highly recommend it. Lastly, I would be <laughs> Run For Your Lives with Daphne and Paik on the Pyrocore Entertainment Network. And they this week's episode, it just dropped. I tried to start listening to it. But this one is a little bit close to me because it's a quiet place. And where they filmed A Quiet Place was literally 1,500 feet from my house, the original movie, which was the house and the barn and the farm area. All that area was filmed, and they were here for three months. So it was pretty cool. You could hear my feedback on that 
podcast and listening to Pake talk because he actually came up and visited my house about, what was it, two years ago, Steve, yep. yourself, Pake, and our friend Kat were up here and we went to a Walker Stalker Con and we just had a good time and we visited the property. You guys got pictures and had fun. Yep. And uh, they, they cover that movie and that movie I thought was really good for a PG-13 kind of suspenseful horror movie. There was no real blood. It's just it got down to the nitty gritty of what you don't see or just that, that feeling of exposure with, with sound or lack of sound at that point too, because you know, that it harkens all the way back to like a Halloween. If you watch the original Halloween, there wasn't really much blood in that movie and the original, it was a lot of like the way they filmed it and angles and everything. So check out a quiet place and Pake and Daphne's coverage on that on run for your lives on the Pyrocore entertainment network. Very cool. So for this podcast, you can hear us on just about any pl any podcast player of choice that's out there. I think we're out on all of them now. Panels to Pixels is. You can find us. Just search for Panels to Pixels. You can check out our website, which is Panels to Pixels Podcast dot com. We love to get uh, feedback through Facebook, which is just Facebook dot com slash Panels to Pixels. You can send us an email or record a voicemail and send it our email to Panels to Pixels one at gmail dot com. That's Panels to Pixels one. The T O is spelled out right there in the middle the number one at gmail.com you can also leave us a voicemail on the phone if you want to call 845-350-2095 we are also on youtube you can check us out there give us a thumbs up it's panels to pixels podcast uh, subscribe to our channel and check it out next week we will be doing episode three of the second season of the boys i don't we might squeeze in two we'll see we'll let you know on facebook whether we're doing just episode three or whether we're gonna do episode three and four but again you can send us feedback for any episode throughout the season because we have watched the whole season and this is going to be a spoiler full rewatch of season two of the boys exactly and where can listeners hear us well i can be found right here on panels of the pixels as well as sending out audio feedback to other podcasts that i love that my friends do you can also hear me on a new podcast called Adrenaline Cinema Podcast on the Pirate Core Entertainment Network. And that podcast is about those action, adventure films, pure action films, or suspense films, and anything to do what gets your adrenaline going while watching these movies that we all love. So Panels to Pixels will remain on the Next Level Podcast Network. And just stay tuned here, and we will keep you up to date of what's going on with Adrenaline Cinema, or just go check us out at the pirate core entertainment website which would be piratecoreentertainment.com and you'll listeners will get a good kick out of this because steve will be our next co-host so he'll be my next co-host for adrenaline cinema and we'll be covering lethal weapon so check that out when it comes out you should be able to have it within another two days after this podcast release very cool. Yeah, I'm excited to be to be on uh, Adrenaline Cinema Podcast and be talking about Lethal Weapon. It's one of my favorite movies, and I remember another movie that I remember going to see in the theater. And uh, yeah, I've got some. I got a bone to pick with Adrenaline Cinema Podcast, but we'll talk about <laughs> it on Adrenaline Cinema Podcast when we get there. But if you want to hear my voice, I will again. I will be on Adrenaline Cinema Podcast. I will always be here on Panels to Pixels, and I send voicemails to various other podcasts that are out there on the podcasting network and the next level podcast network, as well as run for your lives with Pake and Daphne. I sent them a voicemail about the quiet place. Cause it was so cool to actually watch it for the first time and then go visit that location. Yeah, that was fun. So that's our show this week. Thanks everyone for listening. I'm Mark and I'm Steve. And this was panels to pixels and we'll see you on the next panel. Good night, everybody. Good night.